because I have so much to say in only five minutes. First of all, I do want to take a moment to, to give a big round of applause for Rory, Casey, and Madeline. This is amazing. <laughs> great job. Thank you so much for having us. Um, okay, I'm going to read to you. Sorry about that, but um, you know this is my first speed dating opportunity in a conference setting. So, uh, mine is called uh, "Back to the Futures: Everything Old Is New Again." Um, when I was a grad student at the Manoa School of Future Studies at the University of Hawaii, my professor and mentor, Jim Dater, and one of the world's <laughs> premier futurists, always said any useful statement about the futures should appear to be ridiculous. With that in mind, I'm going to walk us through today what may sound preposterous, and that's a good thing. Of all the possible topics for this colloquium, the one I chose to address is what will information work look like without the infrastructures we take for granted? I propose that many of our historical techniques as information professionals could be the way back to a future without computers or digital information. I'm framing my remarks ba based on a dystopian scenario, one that is uh, post-apocalyptic, post-internet, post-computer. Cities have largely been destroyed, small clans of people band together according to their affiliations, familial, religious, political. Electricity as we know it is scarce, coming from solar and wind power. Many libraries, archives, and institutions of learning have been destroyed, and servers storing digital information were wiped out, so knowledge exists only in people's minds and memories. In a world such as this, we may return to our old ways as keepers of knowledge, recounting oral histories through memorization, documenting by hand, creating indexes, and translating textual information into other formats. And in a world without reading and writing as we know it, the young may be educated through singing, dancing, poetry, and pictures, a throwback to learning in ancient times. <coughs> As info pros, our job is evaluating, organizing, and transmitting information, whether primary sources in an archive setting or secondary sources in a library. Currently, that's predicated on societies that support certain systems and technologies and who commit resources to education, publishing, computers, the internet, and much more. We have a vast inner web of technologies, societal expectations, and cultural norms surrounding the transmission of knowledge. Our very democracy is founded on freedom to know what's happening in our government and around us. So it's hard for us to imagine that literacy, reading and writing as we know it, is a fairly recent skill set. Neither Socrates nor Homer were literate, nor was Jesus or the prophet Muhammad. They were all dependent upon scribes to document their words and set them down in written format. In fact, writing was criticized by Socrates in 370 BC as being an artificial aid de memoir when it was first implemented. The technology of writing is only one very specific way of transferring knowledge. Pictures or pictograms are another much older technique. In fact, cave art was an attempt to keep a record of animal species that had been seen before preserving the knowledge about them for when they returned, one of the first uh, instances of records management. Think of infographics and the worldwide popularity of graphic <coughs> novels today. As a prescient prognosticator once said, the last literate person will die in 2050. Well, maybe 2050 is a little too soon since many of us here today will still be alive then. But it will probably be true by 2150. In any case, it's undeniable that graphic and oral, that's uh, hearing, uh, methods of taking in information, i.e. watching and listening, are on the upswing worldwide. Remember the movie Fahrenheit 451, 451? Away from the piles of burning books, the dissenting 1% memorize entire volumes to preserve the obliteration of literature by a dystopian government. They wanted to be able to pass those classics down to the next generation, hopefully after their totalitarian regime was gone. In fact, poets in ancient Greece were regarded as educators, keepers of tradition, human repositories of the collective knowledge of the culture. The poems were not meant to be read in books, but to be performed publicly by his rhapsodies, often accompanied by music. Despite the ambivalence Socrates expressed about the use of writing mentioned earlier, Plato's intellectual revolution away from image thinking and toward abstract thought would have been impossible without the technology of writing. Many, many cultures have passed their history, wisdom, and folkways down in spoken rather than written format. When traditions are kept by professional memorizers, they lay great stress on strict accuracy because they're responsible for preserving the dyna dynastic traditions. One technique to help remember long litanies is to perform them accompanied by song and dance. This also serves to ingrain the lesson in the audience. They become social acts of remembering that imbue them with meaning. Think of the alphabet song we all learned as children to memorize our ABCs. Singing and dancing provides oral, visual, neural, and physical cues that become associated with the message. 
it's not inconceivable that this method could return as in the days of yore. We, in particular, may inherit the important role of mnemonic professionals. In a society where reading and writing are no longer commonplace, and with schools no longer teaching cursive handwriting, we could also take on the role of interpreting what has survived in text for our patrons. Ironically, the reverse of the scribes of yore who wrote things down for others who couldn't write. In fact, the patronage system itself could come back with only the privilege of affording, ac affording access to scarce information. Time ward methods of organizing and finding information could make a comeback as well. For instance, the importance of alphabetical order. Yet, even if we do return to Garrett's old ways, our implementation will invariably be different since we've had the experience of digital um, information organization. I'm skipping over some uh, more here if you want to talk to me later. So to reiterate the question, what we started out with is what will information look, work look like without the infrastructures we take for granted? I propose that serving as professional memorizers, translating written sources for a post-literate population, documenting concepts through pictures, recitation and song, and creating guides and indexes for residual textual information may become our most valuable contributions in such an era. The technologies will surely change along a spectrum of analog, an analog, digital, holographic, and other formats we can't yet imagine. But our mission will remain the same. Of this, I have mo no doubt. Thank you. So, I go in the presentation files. Is that right? Hi everyone, I'm Jim Bonet. I'm a social sciences and humanities librarian at the University of Maine. And I'll be discussing a collaborative program hosted in our library that is intended to engage students in critical issues of sustainability in the 21st century. For some background, in the fall of 2013, I joined UMaine, as did an early career anthropology professor who has a joint appointment in our Climate Change Institute. As part of her position, she studies the impacts of climate on human behavior. As her liaison librarian, we soon met to discuss the possibilities for collaboration within our research and teaching missions. And after multiple conversations, we found that we were both interested in creating co-curricular opportunities uh, for student engagement, possibly through film, that would complement her department's newly created major, The Human Dimensions of Climate Change. We were left pondering, how might an academic library reach out to students to seed a dialogue on climate change? How might films contribute to sustained conversations? What if the focus were on the human dimensions of environmental adaptation? Also important for us to consider at a financially constrained institution, how might we pursue opportunities with low cost and high impact? By the spring of 2014, we had designed a three-part film series on the human dimensions of climate change that took place during three consecutive weeks in March and April and had a thematic focus on vulnerability and social resilience. Films were purchased by and screened in the library, and following each film was a facilitated discussion by a faculty member with related expertise. Given its popularity, the series just finished its fourth year, which additional themes that have centered on the politics of climate change and science communication. To keep down costs, while we've purchased some films, we've made use of existing collections, used some free films online, and drawn on internal experts as discussants. Participation has included students, faculty, staff, and community members who bring a range of perspectives on important and controversial topics. And attendees tend to join for multiple viewings, which creates continuity and community among participants and is especially conducive to post-film discussions. Since our first year, our expert discussants have included both faculty and students from various departments, including Native American studies, anthropology, political science, communication and journalism, the Office of Sustainability, and Marine Sciences. This diverse pool of discussants has the potential to engage a wider swath, engage a wider swath of the community, and they tend to bring their own enthusiastic audience. The number, of <laughs> the number of people in attendance thus far has ranged from the low 20s to the upper 50s, which just about maxes out our library classroom, which we like to see. Questions that arise during our discussions typically don't have simple answers, but generate rich conversation. 
after we watched an episode of Years of Living Dangerously that focused on the daughter of an evangelical preacher who was attempting to convince her father that combating climate change was a religious value. One student asked, do we need to spend our time trying to persuade climate change resistors? After we watched In the Path of Resistance about the Keystone Pipeline, a student asked, how can we build coalitions to affect political progress on the environment? After we watched The Anthropologist, the discussant asked the audience, what can ethnography contribute to what we understand about climate change? In addition to the films, physical and virtual displays in the library accompany the series and highlight a wide range of uh, um, educational resources related to the topics under discussion. We often update the virtual display throughout the series in response to conversations about the films or related issues, and we've documented each of the four series in our institutional repository by uploading the publicity posters. We've even extended the life and possibly the impact of the series through social media campaigns like this one for Earth Week, uh, where we promoted library collections, activities, and amenities, including the series. Um, and those were some of our most popular posts. The series even caught the attention of um, the campus newspaper and the radio station, which has generated buzz for future series like it. At this point, we're planning to submit a proposal to a university-sponsored cultural grants fund to hopefully bring a documentary filmmaker to our neck of the woods in Maine. Uh, we hope to further galvanize discussion and provide opportunities for folks to meet and learn from a renowned public figure um, who's working to communicate, to communicate climate change to a public audience. Um, this is a growing interest on our campus and one that crosses disciplinary boundaries. But we plan to con uh, continue the series whether or not money materializes. So if you have ideas on how we might think about or enhance our program, I hope you will feel free to reach out. And thank you very much. So we're going to talk about open scholarship. So here's the problem. Our scholarly communication system is broken, or at minimum, it needs serious reform. It's pervaded by neoliberalism. And the question we ask is, can we envision a world where research is treated as a public good and not as a commodity? And we'll talk about many kinds of open, open access, open science, open data. Um, open is so critical, but we do not believe that open in and of itself is going to really solve the crisis of climate change. Um, that really much lies in climate change communication, which we, we came up earlier. Um, as to the internal politics of climate change, um, we must resist a system that enriches corporations that exploit our researchers who have bought into the legacy prestige journal model. So why open access? Um, open access was created to make scholarship freely available. And serial expenditures increased 402% from 1986 to 2011. And the big publishers make as much as a 40% profit. Um, even as recently as 2016, Elsevier's profit margin was 36%. Um, and on top of it, they've increased their embargo period for self-archiving articles uh, up to four years. So why do these publishers profit so much? Well, scholars give it away in terms of peer review and their scholarship. And then the publishers turn around and sell the content back to libraries. Um, open access was intended to level the playing field, but only 15% of all articles are open access, and much of that is because of funder mandates. 
Um, article processing charges are typically built into grants to pay for immediate open access, but what's insidious is that the corporate publishers have gotten in on that game. I also want to mention that Elsevier now has a new um, institutional repository program so they can monetize um, that type of open access. So we should be concerned that much of open access is still modeled on a legacy publishing system. And the question is, why isn't all academic publishing not-for-profit and scholar-centered? I want to talk really quickly about the Global South because they're going to be the most affected by climate change. There's all this vibrant scholarship in the Global South, and there are issues with its dissemination because of um, the standards are towards the global north. Okay. Um, in the last couple of decades, the way scientists work has really changed. I'm referring to open science, or you might hear it called open notebook science, where researchers can share works in progress, hypotheses, raw data via these online platforms and collaborative technologies we have now. And it's a very uh, networked research culture, data intensive, yet it's quick dynamic and it's often done in teams that are geographically distributed and have people from different uh, disciplines and thus this seems like a really good approach uh, for climate researchers uh, sample workflow and we also think this is a, a good way that the way scientists communicate with each other can change kind of corresponding to the uh, what we heard about climate communication this morning and not only does open science amplify resources available for problem solving but there's a transparency that comes from posting what you're doing online and commenting on what your peers are doing in real time. And we think that that would help with issues like the reproducibility crisis that sort of undermine uh, the impact that climate research has with the public. Uh, a little bit more about open data. One of the most important aspects of open science is open data, by which I mean data that's free to use or reuse, redistribute. More actors can get in on using it. Uh, we've seen the rise of citizen science, which is really helpful in projects where a large amount of observable data has to be collected or analyzed. And da data can be ephemeral. Uh, we've heard about data refuge already today. This is another good place to think about that. Uh, grassroots efforts that involve a lot of people in a lot of places um, sort of rescuing uh, the data. And so the next question is, what can we do about this? And going back to what Monica was saying earlier, um, you know, as librarians and archivists, we care about preservation and inf information standards, interoperability, and so we're calling for working for a scholarly communications ecosystem that incorporates the kind of features that, that we talked about here today. Thanks. So uh, my name is Bob Chen. My uh, colleague Bob Downs is a digital archivist and uh, works in my organization. He had to be in South Africa, the poor guy, to speak. Um, but uh, we work uh, uh, at Columbia, but we run a, uh, I, I manage a NASA data center, which has been around for over 20 years, um, which has focused really on the intersection between, among other things, the social and natural sciences. And um, if you're talking about the Anthropocene, you really need to think about data information coming from both those disciplines. But they don't automatically uh, go together. It takes effort um, and uh, interaction among the sciences, uh, as well as among other kinds of users. Um, so this data center does focus on the human dimensions of environmental change. Um, we work with a broad community. Uh, we, as it turns out, use geospatial approaches because that helps uh, in many cases uh, bridge the disciplinary boundaries. Um, and uh, it's all open access data and tools. Um, uh, so I'm just going to talk about a few of the barriers that we run across on integration across these science barriers. 
I mean, clearly social and health scientists tend to focus on people, administrative units, that sort of thing. Environmental scientists tend to think about, you know, pixels or sensor uh, uh, swaths or other kinds of geographies. Um, lots of differences in time scales, lots of different kinds of data that are, look similar. And if you're not in the discipline, you really get confused about what's important, what's the right one that fits. Um, and that's, of course, in the internet age getting even more to be more of a problem where we're not just data scarce like we used to be, we're really flooded by data and, and the issue is really figuring out how to boil things down in a, in a reasonable way. And of course on the uh, social science side uh, you have issues like confidentiality and privacy, um, which of course natural scientists have no idea what an institutional review board is or what human <laughs> subjects regs are. Um, big differences in intellectual property and control over data between disciplines, which you know gets to the open access issue we just heard about. And um, uh, so anyway, this is just some of the kinds of issues. Um, so uh, in our data center, we have really three approaches, uh, three basic approaches. One is how do you just make data more easy to integrate? Uh, so how do you convert from census units, administrative units, to a form that, say, environmental scientists can use. So we georeference data, we grid it, and so forth, and, and we have a, one of the earliest uh, gridded, global gridded population products. Uh, it's now in its fourth version. Uh, but then we also take data that people have integrated. So one of the problems is if you have natural social health scientists creating data, where does that data go? A social science data archive I'm on the council of the Inter-University Consortium for Political and Social Research. You know, they have expertise in social science data, but they don't have expertise in environmental data. Uh, and if you're an environmental uh, archive, you don't know what to do with this social science data. So you need a new breed of, or a type of archive and, and repository that understands both sides of this. And so, for example, we have lots of data sets. One of them is called, actually called, Anthro, uh, anthropogenic biomes, because it combines uh, your typical um, uh, land use class, land classification data with other kinds of, of data to pr produce, in this case, a four uh, century uh, record or, or uh, attempt to assess land use change uh, from 1700 to 2000. Uh, and then, of course, uh, in the internet age, we have to focus on how to get data out, how to make it more accessible, more usable through open services, through new tools, through handheld, you know, apps and other tools. And um, we also have to focus, especially when you automate these things, on how do you make data open through things like open data licenses that are machine readable, you know, so you can avoid issues like arguing over whether something's commercial or non-commercial. And, and or has to be shared alike, those, those get in the way of applications. So actually we work closely with the Columbia Libraries, um, the Copyright Advisory Office, and some international groups that are working on these legal interoperability issues. Um, so just one example, oops. Um, uh, for example, if you look at the population settlement, you, you can easily get confused because there's lots of different kinds of data of uh, population. Uh, 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 radar, high resolution remote sensing imagery. And so the, the other function we do is how do you get public private partnerships uh, to share data? Uh, so we've been working with Facebook, Google, uh, Esri, and other groups, uh, but also public and private, just, just to get them to share data and make sense of it. And I thought you guys would like this cartoon. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>
Hi, my name is Hannah Hamalainen. I'm the Geospatial and Earth Sciences Librarian at the University of New Hampshire. And I'm talking a little bit about uh, humanitarian crisis mapping in the library. It's a personal project because I actually was in Haiti right before the earthquake and I was able to um, do a lot of research and help later on. But um, I really wanted to talk a, t a little bit about um, why uh, humanitarian crisis mapping is so important. So um, when the earthquake hit in Haiti in 2010, there was a lot of problems. Um, there were people that couldn't get the supply route to get uh, water, supplies, other things to, um, I'm going to do this. Um, they weren't able, the buildings collapsed, concrete bu buildings that didn't have stability, um, supply routes were um, interrupted, and many people were trapped underneath rubble. Now, these people were doing live tweets, and they were ask actually asking for help. So about the same time, and hopefully this video will actually work. So about the same time as this earthquake was going on, a few hours after the earthquake, there were hundreds of different volunteers here in the U.S. and around the world that um, went and um, geotagged the references of all these different tweets and put them together in a really nice map of visu visualization. And you can't see this, can you? really pretty on my screen. <laughs> <laughs> and you tag the location so that they could uh, better assist people um, in the long run. This live information was collected and it was later on given to the US Marines and to other people who are doing search and rescue. And people were able to take that satellite imagery, which is what you're seeing here, and adopt it in from contact from the world map, which was really, really great. And I'm sorry, you didn't see that. Perfect. So this process that I was just trying to t explain poorly is uh, called um, crisis mapping or humanitarian mapping. In with climate change, we're already seeing there a, dem a lot of increase in clim climate change, natural disasters, <laughs> flooding, um, hazards, war, um, other things that interrupt human lives. And these snowstorms and earthquakes and tsunamis um, are becoming more and more prevalent. And when these natural disasters um, ha happen, real-time humanitarian response is essential. So these crisis mappers, these volunteer aperture mappers and digital humanitarians, they utilize a variety of different technological-based um, skills to assist those people on the, on the ground, those humanitarians that are doing that live help. They are going and they're, they're um, helping with edit digital maps that provide the disaster relief support. This is often done in a style of a mapping party or a mapathon. And it's really, really great if you've ever been to it. These volunteers create digital maps in a web browser to using satellite imagery. Look, something like that, this. This is something called OpenStreetMap, and it becomes more and more important to help figure out how to get food and water to different places. Another great example, this is actually um, an OpenStreetMap tasking map manager. It's a mapping tool designed just to help people to learn relief. It's very easy to learn. Now, there are many different nonprofit groups and, plat and mapping platforms which enable these volunteers to assist in disaster relief. And here's just a handful. But really, what I'm talking to you about, about is what does humanitarian disaster relief response have to do with a library? Okay, so all you really need to do to, to do disaster relief in the volunteer world is to have access to a computer, the internet, and space. Maybe free food, too. Mm -hmm. But libraries are really uniquely designed to be able to assist with this. We have a responsibility to foster civic en engagement. We can continue the efforts by, to um, help the future by leading introductory crisis mapping workshops, teaching people these basic skills just to learn how to do it. Um, now, library is not just the same place to consume information, we create information, which is wonderful. We have the physical space, those computers, that internet, and we can connect people by ho hosting these events. We can ha act on behalf of our community and help rekindle civic engagement and connect citizens. We also have a responsibility to inform and educate. Now, when you have a bunch of people coming together to do mapping, sometimes the skill set isn't quite what you need it to be and there, pro there are problems. But librarians, you know what we do? We know a lot, of, a lot, a lot, a lot about usability and reliability. We know how to understand and interpret data and information literacy. And so we can help respond and um, inform and educate. And lastly, librarians have a responsibility to respond to the culture of need. So libraries don't dictate culture, right? We respond to it. 
And as librarians and information professionals, we need to work for our community, get buy-in, and try to help people. So I'm seeing a world where there's innovation coming, where people come to the library, they don't just ask, where is Port-au-Prince? Now they're asking, how can I help the people in Port-au-Prince? I think this is the next generation for us. We have a few minutes for questions. Okay. Oh, we have more questions. Hi again, Fred Stoss from uh, UB Buffalo. Um, uh, Bob, perhaps you may be uh, best uh, uh, able to start start something. Um, I know that there's a number of uh, scientific associations, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, American Academy Society, and American Institute for Biological Sciences that are doubling and redoubling their efforts to get their scientists to become better communicators to talk to the public at large. What are some of the, bar some of the barriers that we see in terms of how do we get that the complexities of the data that, that, that is being archived, about, especially about climate change, into a format that can be uh, that can be understood by the, the general public at large. Uh, yeah, I think almost all the societies have been working on that, on how to get scientists to communicate better with congressional staff and the public at large. Um, you know, I, you know, my viewpoint in our, our organization, a lot of what we have. Uh, focused on recently are uh, what we generally call decision support systems. So how, how do you take all this complex data, put it into a form so that you can understand? We have one for Jamaica Bay called Adapt Map, which is gives you sea level rise scenarios. And it's aimed at planners. It's aimed at general public to better understand what sea level rise might mean, on what time frame, on what time scale. Um, so we have a number of those tools. They, takes effort to design them and learn better to communicate. So you have to study how well you do in terms of uh, communication. So it's, you know, it's an area of research as well as application. And I want to add, um, I, I recently attended a really great workshop called the Allen Alda Center for Communicating Science. Some n people are nodding their heads because it's New York based. Um, I was fortunate to be able to go to this as part of my academic education, but um, one of the key points coming out of it is storytelling. It's really getting that human implement into it. If you give them numbers, they're not going to remember. I can tell the numbers over every day, but it's it's the back end, the storytelling. And so every association, like whether it's GSA or AGU or anything else, so, um, they're really starting to facilitate some of the storytelling and adapting <coughs> it into, into their work. And one side note. Um, there's a really great podcast called Generation Anthropocene that comes out of Stanford University. They do a really great job at talking about um, climate change and in a format that's storytelling. And um, I just want to mention that because it's I, I listen to it every week. looking 
perhaps are telling a lot more stories um, um, as we de try to design it. May I just piggyback on it? If people <coughs> haven't heard of Marshall Gantz, he's a professor at the Kennedy School, at mm -hmm. Harvard Kennedy School, and he also is like a long uh, history of teaching storytelling for the social action movement. So somebody to know, and you can find him on YouTube, like teaching how to tell stories for social action. Just if I can make a comment though, I mean, even though I think storytelling is valuable, yeah. I, to my mind the lesson is uh, you have to think about what your users want, need to know, and how they operate. So we did have done some projects where the target was economists and business people. They don't care about stories. <laughs> they want numbers that are defensible, that make sense. So it's our job to translate to whatever the user wants. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the public may want stories, but when I say decision support, sometimes the decision decision makers are making it based on quantitative analysis and, and other kinds of information. And if you just throw stories at them, you're not going to get very far. Um, yeah, I would just like uh, not to be a gadfly, but I'd like to propose an alternative to storytelling. You know, storytelling sort of starts to show up in the 70s as a left wing or progressive discourse kind of in line with reclaiming folklore, you know, reclaiming Americanism uh, in a more progressive way. And what happens is that uh, it moves into documentary film and television and it becomes a really hackneyed way of flattening out, in most cases, flattening out diverse uh, situations and treating them, narrativizing them, treat, you know, looking for exemplary characters, looking for narrative arcs. And, you know, you have a lot of documentaries that tend to look the same. Um, and what I'd rather do, what I've tried to do a little bit, not got very far, is sensitize um, uh, lay people to, to look at archival evidence and make sense out of it themselves. They're quite interested in doing that. And you know, my experience through um, screenings with unedited film footage is that people are capable, willing, and excited about making their own narratives out of raw. That's, that's my alternative. Not just the story, but the evidence. 